Well, we've been doing <clears throat> uh, a, well, it's a series on a practical, tactical Christianity. And we, if you want to get back and look at some of the messages, we've gone through the practical part. And the Bible is so practical. Uh, it has something for everyday life on how to run a family, how to uh, love your wife, how to honor your husband, how to train your children, uh, how to treat your neighbor. Uh, the Bible is the most practical book on planet Earth, and it should be because God inspired it. And so we have it, uh, and we should read it, and we should live by it. Uh, as we look at <clears throat> God's Word, we uh, last week we asked you uh, to reimagine church. And uh, hopefully you didn't get the wrong idea of that. I used Target as an example. Now, I'm not telling you, I'm not promoting Target, and I'm not promoting why Target spent $7 billion to reach a different and changing culture. I'm not, I'm not telling you uh, that uh, go to Target. But it's a hangout, I guess, nowadays uh, for some young college students and for people. Uh, they're reaching out, uh, and they're doing it to raise money. They want money. And we are doing and reimagining church to see people come to know Jesus and have hope. I think we have a better reason, don't we? And, and so, but if the, if the business world is thinking on how they can do things differently, the church needs to think differently too. And <clears throat> so I had a plethora of ideas that came in from you. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, and I can see why there's so many different denominations in, in, in our country. Uh, because we're not always gonna agree on everything, are we? And, you know, my idea of, of reimagining is different than yours. And so there's a lot of different things. And, and so again, uh, we want to reimagine church. But I think the most important thing, it's not about making church people happy. As much as I love all of you, it's about reaching the lost. And that's why we are reimagining church. That's what we want you to think about, uh, is how can we reach people that won't walk in the doors of a church today? How can we reimagine uh, reaching out and touching lives that are full of pain? How can we reach people that don't think they need God? Uh, ever-changing culture, and so that's why we are reimagining church. And there were a lot of great ideas, really were, and I'll talk about a few of those, but great ideas, and I really appreciate it. Our staff and board will be praying about those to see if God likes the ideas. And so that's the most important thing, isn't it, to see what God has and how we reach out to a lost and dying world. <clears throat> and so as we look at this, uh, the purpose uh, let's turn to our text, Mark chapter 2, and Jesus, again, uh, giving us, of course, the, the right way to do things, but and the right reason to do things. Mark 2, and we'll start with 15, says, Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests along with many tax collectors and others, sinners. They were sinners, and uh, there were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? Pretty amazing words, isn't it? This is from the church in Israel. Uh, this is from religious people. And when religious people have the attitude they're, that they're better than anybody, it's a sin. We're not better than anybody. And, and so Christians have to have a different attitude. Uh, and, and so Jesus hung out with sinners. He hung out with people that were hurting. And he did that uh, he was accused of being a drunkard uh, when he hung out with them, but he hung out with people that needed a Savior, people that needed a Savior. And that's why Jesus came to this earth, and what a wonderful Savior we have. And so uh, Jesus went on, and let's look at the rest of that. Uh, 
It, Jesus uh, looked at them when he, uh, when Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. What a wonderful statement that Jesus made. I'm so glad Jesus came for sinners, that he loved us so much that he died for our, our sins. And so what does that all mean? Well, of course, <clears throat> it means that we should have a concern for the lost. And I think every Bible-believing church, their number one focus, of course, to love God with all our hearts, but to do what God told us to do, and that was to go all, in all the world and make disciples to see people come to know him, to bring the good news to a lost and dying world. And if we don't do that, we're just another country club having our little times together. And that's not what God wants for his church. And so uh, the purpose to reach the lost. In our Wednesday night uh, services, we've been talking about priorities. And I think most of you would agree uh, that priorities... Uh, when we look at it as a Christian and we look at the Bible, number one, God should be at the top of our list. God should be our number one priority. Number two, I believe, is family. God has blessed us with family. I don't want to go to heaven without my family. And the Bible says, if any man doesn't take care of his family, he's worse than an infidel. God wants us to love our family to nurture them, not just with food and paying the bills, but to nurture them spiritually and to lead them right into the kingdom of God. And so family uh, should be right there as a priority. Uh, third, I believe, is God's church. Uh, we are his bride, the bride of Christ. He loves his church. And the people are the church. You are the church. And I love God's people. And we, we want to nurture God's people so they, in turn, can go out and help others. And so God's church is so very, very important. Then I was thinking, number four, uh, people. People are a priority. They're such a priority that that's why John 3.16 uh, was written for us. For God so loved that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, any whosoever is out there, Whosoever, he, God will give uh, this wonderful message to whoever wants to come to him. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And so if God loves people that much, if that's a priority with him, it should be a priority in my life. And sometimes uh, we, the church, Christians, get desensitized uh, to the people around us. Uh, we... We are challenged. Sometimes we get sick of everything you see on the news and you, and you think, oh, they deserve hell, right? And you, you get this attitude and, and you're upset with all the junk that we see. There's a lot of sin out there, isn't there? And, and that's why they need to hear about Jesus. We have a wonderful Savior that loves people. He died for sinners. Sometimes the longer you've been a Christian, you forget where you really came from and how people think. And not a lot of them are thinking about God. They're not thinking about God and more in our society than ever before. And so, <clears throat> so there's a changing culture and God loves people. He wants us to love people. Uh, Matthew, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. And we'll look at verses... 35 through 37. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into 
the fields. Well, here we see a, a beautiful text, but uh, Jesus went around sharing the good news. And so a lot of times we make witnessing harder than it really is. And if Jesus shared the good news, uh, then we should be sharing the good news. And he shared the good news that there's hope. There's hope for forgiveness of sins. There's hope of eternal life. We can live forever. Uh, there's, there's hope in our, in our uh, families. And there's hope for disease. Jesus heals us. Uh, there's hope. And that's what Jesus said. And, you know, we make it so hard. But um, how many of you remember the actual time and the moment where you gave your heart to Jesus? Just slip your hand up. You remember that moment. Pretty interesting. Uh, I'll never forget the moment. It was July of 1968. I'll never forget the place that was at First Presbyterian Church in Duluth. Never forget it. But so often... As Christians, we, get, we become friends with other Christians. We do things with other Christians. And the world is lost, and we're not rubbing shoulders with the world and sharing the good news. And so, as we get to know other people that don't know Christ, we share the good news. And personal good news is pretty important. And so for you, remembering what God has done in your life is important to share with others because they'll listen to your story, not pushing. Uh, there's different ways people are trying to do this. Uh, some are yelling at you and telling you you're going to hell on the street corners in different cities. Anyone ever encounter that? Well, not a real good way to witness. But anyway, so uh, we want to share, <coughs> share God's love with people because God loves people. And so... Here we, we see that there's an important part here. Uh, Jesus uh, went there. He shared the good news. You share your testimony. And maybe you say, I really don't know what my testimony is. Maybe you say, I was raised in the church. I became a Christian in Sunday school class when I was seven. I remember my teacher praying with our class, and I gave my heart to Jesus. And I've been in church ever since, and I love Jesus. But I wasn't a drug addict, and I wasn't a bank robber, and I didn't do all these bad... You know what? That's the best testimony of all, isn't it? That you walked with Jesus, you put your trust in him, and you're living for him today. And he is, he is your life. But so often, friends, we, we don't realize that's good news. Share the good news, how you became a Christian with other people. Let them know how God loves you and he loves them. And it's natural. When I got saved, uh, when I was just going into eighth grade, it was the first day I became a Christian that I started sharing my testimony with my family. My mother said it wouldn't last. That was 50 years ago. It's lasted because God is faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. And so as we put our trust in him, he's so good to us. He's faithful. And so share the good news. In school, I'd share the good news with people I was sitting next to in class. I remember one day this one girl looked really down and we were in choir and <clears throat> she was just, I said, are you doing okay? She said, no, I'm really not. And I said, can we pray? And so you pray with the person. You don't have to sit there and tell them they're going to hell. You just show love to them. And little by little, the bridge is being built. And maybe they'll sit with you someday in church, and maybe they'll give their heart to Jesus. You see, we have to build bridges to people that need Jesus. We have to love people. But how do we get that, uh, that urgency in our heart to do it? How do we get the urgency? When somebody is dying, we get an urgency to pray because we want to see our loved one live. Well, people are dying spiritually all around us, and we need to have an urgency to talk with those people about the Lord and to share the good news. And it can happen anywhere. We talked about reimagining church, but I want you to reimagine evangelism. I want you to reimagine on how we reach the lost. That's what we have to reimagine. And it can happen every day if we're ready. Every day. I, I, I've shared this before, but I've had so many opportunities. I call it want that evangelism. And so, uh, and you need something. You go to their home and uh, they invite you in. You're already there, right? 
It's not like the Jehovah Witness knocking at your door and, and scaring you or whatever. You're, you're looking for something, but all of a sudden an opportunity opens up. And you start sharing about Jesus. You maybe share the good news. I asked one lady, and I tell you this is a, a good question. It opens up the doors. I always ask, where do you go to church in the area? That brings up a lot of conversation. Uh, when I asked this one lady, <clears throat> uh, it was so sweet. She said, I don't go to church. And uh, she said, I haven't been to church for a long time, for over 25 years. And I said, why not? She said, I'm mad at God. That's what she said. I'm mad at God. I said, why are you mad at God? Because he took my husband 25 years ago. Pain. Pain that people experience. Pain that they go through things, and then they blame God. And, and so we sat there, and I said, you've been mad at God that long? I said, isn't that a long time to stay mad? Well, I guess so. And, and I said, God loves you so much. And I said, could I pray for you? And she said, sure. And so people, God loves people. So I prayed. <clears throat> And, and I just said, God, we'll just call her Susie. Susie's been mad at you for a long time. And she just started giggling. And I said, I'd like to see you make up today. Share, share the good news. Pray with people. Love people was able to just embrace her and just show her love. Talked to one man. He was, I thought my mother-in-law maybe could use the car. He was selling a car. I went there and I said, well, I don't know. This is kind of maybe too big for her. And, and I, I said, well, but what church do you go to? You live right in the area? I don't go to church right now, but I was raised in a Catholic church. And he was a retired <coughs> school a superintendent. And we had nice talk. And, and as we were sharing... I started sharing a little bit about um, when he said I go to the Catholic Church. I said, what's your definition in the church about what a true Christian is? And he said, well, you know, I'm not really sure. Not really sure. I said, would you like to know what the Bible says about it? He said, yeah, I'd like to know that. So he invited me into his house. We sat there and talked, and I showed him through Scripture. This is what Jesus said. You must be born again. And that happens by a personal invitation where we invite Christ into our heart. Amen. And how wonderful to sit there. And I told him that Jesus knocks at the door in Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. I said, he's just knocking at your heart's door. Would you invite him in today? Yes, I will. And we prayed together. It's so beautiful what God can do. And, and the thing is, we, we need to get the urgency. That man died a month later. He, got, he died. I, I had a lady from our church. Did you know that man you prayed? He died a month later. You see, friends, we need an urgency to share the good news of Jesus with people. Uh, the love of God with people. It's not that hard to do. We make it hard. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to share the love of Jesus with people. You need a testimony. And nobody can tell you that your testimony is wrong. Because what God has done for you is totally real for you. And we share that. And that's why it's good to even write down your testimony and to condense it so you can talk with people and share with them important things to do. So Jesus, here we see, he loves people. And he, it says he looked at the crowds and he had compassion on them. In Matthew 9, he had compassion on them because it says they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were confused and helpless. When I look at society, I see people that are not just confused. I see people that have totally been deceived. Our society has been deceived when we don't know if I'm a little boy or a little girl. 
our society has been deceived to believe a lie. And it's getting worse all the time. It's getting worse all the time. We've been deceived. Uh, I remember back in <clears throat> the 60s, uh, when I went to the guidance office, that was quite frequent. And when I would go to the guidance office and the counselor, uh, I would sit down with him and he had right on his, his hard to believe, on his desk, the Holy Bible. And he'd take it out and read it to me. Now we've kicked God out of our schools, prayer out of our schools. We don't want God to be a part of our life, and we're reaping the consequences. And our culture is confused. Like last week, I said, back in 1970, 10% of children that were born were born out of wedlock. Today, 40% of children that are born are born out of wedlock. Our culture is losing sight of biblical values and Christ's teachings. And instead of condemning them, we need to build bridges and let them see what God wants for their life. And it's so important for all of us to be able to do that. They were helpless, like sheep, without a shepherd. And then Jesus said something that really uh, jumped off the page here to me. Uh, it, it's, it's all about compassion. It says, when he looked at the crowds, Jesus had compassion on them. Do you have compassion towards people that don't know Jesus Christ? Do you really have compassion? Do you really care? And like I said, church, this is not a country club. If you want to have a nice social gathering, don't come here. This church was established 27 years ago for one purpose. So people would come to know God and love God with all their heart, all their mind, soul, and strength. That's why this was established, so people could come to know Jesus. And God still wants the church to do that. That's why he said, go into all the world. And who did he tell to go into all the world? His disciples, which is, that's synonymous with Christians. And if you're a Christian, you need to be sharing the good news. I think the key <clears throat> to reimagining church is to start reimagining what God can do in our neighbors, our coworkers, the people we sit next to in school. Uh, God wants to touch their lives. How can we do it? Well, compassion is going to be one of the key ingredients. Compassion. Uh, it's, it's, like I said, it's a changing culture. Uh, in Isaiah, it says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. And that's what our society is doing. So we see an ever-changing society. <clears throat> Jesus saw people, he had compassion. <clears throat> compassion includes loving kindness and concern for the suffering and misfortunes of others. Loving kindness and concern. That's part of it. Compassion refers to both an understanding of another's pain and the desire to somehow mitigate that pain. So that's compassion. Understanding someone else's pain. And if you were not raised in a family that was full of dysfunction, you might not understand the pain they're going through. Did you ever think that maybe you've gone through some things and some of the hard things you've gone through, God has allowed so you can help others going through those same things? And there are people with pain all around us. And we don't see it sometimes. <clears throat> when I went to school and I acted up in school, people didn't know the pain I was going through in my home. They didn't know the fear I had on Friday and Saturday nights when the bars would close and, and then all chaos would happen in our home. The fighting, the swearing, the throwing of things and breaking of things, crashing, my mother suicidal, holding her wrist when she wants to end her life. All of those things. They, they didn't imagine the pain. My basketball coach, after I wrote my book, The Hillside Story, he said, Thor, he said, we've got to get together, have lunch. He 
He said, Thor, we knew you guys came from some tough backgrounds in the hillside. He said, but I would have never imagined what you went through. And friends, that can be our next door neighbor. It can be a rich and wealthy business person. You see, Satan hates people. And he wants to destroy lives, period. A lot of rich people commit suicide because they have a lot of pain. It's not just the poor and needy. It's not just the Central Hillside kids. It's every kid on this planet that God loves. Every kid. Every person. And so we go through that pain. We go through that pain. And the pain is real. And we wonder how we can make it. And people, your next door neighbors, you don't even know. Maybe kids, your friends, your kids hang out with someone in school. It doesn't matter. We don't understand the pain. But the pain is real. And, and those memories sometimes never leave us. And they can haunt you for life. They can embitter you. All of these things that people go through. I'm so glad that when we went through this pain and the pain and the memories, when they came and put my mother in a straitjacket and took her to the psych ward, going to see her in the psych ward and her eyes are black and she's in a catatonic state. The pain and the memories and wondering, what are we going to do? We didn't have a clue. Five kids in a, in a home wondering, what do we do? What do we do? I'm glad I had an aunt that prayed for us. I'm glad there was a UMD college student, shy as all get out, but he went to Urbana conference and heard Billy Graham speak and that you're a missionary right where you're planted. I'm glad he heard that because then he prayed, God, give me five kids in the Central Hillside to pour my life into, and I'll do that for you. And that's where I met him at First Press because they opened their gym up for kids to come and play basketball. That's why we have a gym here. We want to see people come <clears throat> somehow so we can reach them with the good news. This guy didn't know the pain I was going through, but he prayed. And then he invites me to a Bible study. It can be as simple as saying, hey, we have Sunday school. We invite kids to Sunday school. It can be inviting them to church. It can be inviting them to a home Bible study. It can be just going out to dinner. It can be uh, going out and, and shooting clay pigeons. Where is? There you are. <laughs> Little Danny Turnquist. Well, Dan, that's a pretty good idea. He said, Pastor, let's just anything we can do to rub shoulders with the world. To get to know people, because most of them won't come to a Bible study or come to church. <clears throat> I'll never forget that night when we went to that Bible study, he invited me, and pretty soon I had five or six kids coming with me. And it was the third night that I got on my knees and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. If you knew me before, you would realize when a person is born again, there's an amazing change that takes place. That's what Jesus does. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. And that's what we want to bring to people. That's why we want you to invite them with you to church so they can experience that wonderful born-again relationship. Like I said, I never knew what it was. <clears throat> but when I walked up that hill in July of 1968, after I prayed that prayer, never heard the word born again, I knew I was a new person. Something had changed. And then never forget when I walked up the stairs that night, and my mother was standing at the door, and she said, are you on drugs or what? I said, no, I became a Christian tonight. And I'll never forget her words. It won't last. I tried it when I was a kid. We started praying for those around us. My sisters, they get mad at me. <clears throat> You're not a Christian. You just swore. And then I'd swear at them again. <laughs> and, and so, uh, but they would get at you. It's hard with family. Uh, my brothers, 
just amazing. Seven years old, they were in there hearing me tell my mother about inviting Christ into my life. And they went into their bedroom. And did the same. My one brother, Henry, was a missionary in Brazil for over seven years, <clears throat> working with street kids. My brother, Paul, works with people that he's a counselor with addictions. Both of my sisters finally gave their heart to the Lord. My mother, after two years of praying for her, came out of the bar and came home and got on her knees and invited Christ into her life. My dad is a very, was a very stubborn Norwegian and took him 25 years, but he gave his heart to the Lord. So with your pain, see, it, it's, it's not a panacea to get rid of our pain. As a Christian, you'll still have pain. I still had pain when I went home. <clears throat> but now I had the comforter. I had the comforter. And in my pain, I had hope. What a difference knowing Jesus does. So here, full of pain. But now I have hope in my pain. That's what Jesus will do for any person. We can't tell them that everything's going to be better. But we can, we can tell them that there's hope because of Jesus. And someday, yes, it will be better. And we have a hope for all eternity to be with him. What a wonderful God we have. And so <clears throat> in our society, there's so many hurting children, hurting families, hurting people all around us. And if the church sits back and doesn't do anything about it, they're going to just sit there lost in their pain and in their sin. And they don't know what to tell or who to tell. I have pain and I don't know what to do with it. And we're here. And we have the answer, don't we? Because Jesus is the answer. He is definitely the answer for this world today. And this little girl wants to give her heart to Jesus right now. Let her come on up here. She's running to the altar. <clears throat> little sinners repent, right? <laughs> no, beautiful. So, so God loves people, doesn't he? He just loves people so very much. And he wants us to love people. And I pray that you will catch this vision, uh, that we will reimagine how we can reach the lost, how we can reach the lost in our community with the good news of Jesus. It is the good news. It's the best news. And <clears throat> I had one great idea that came in. I thought it was wonderful. And there are really so many good ideas. But one, one great idea was uh, that a gentleman said, I want to suggest that the church, and that's us, gets more involved in the secular world. Interesting comment. It, but it's a very important comment. Because unless we're rubbing shoulders with people that don't go to church, how are we going to be the salt of the earth? How are we going to be the light, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine. How are we going to do that if we just huddle up with Christians in our little groups? Maybe we've had enough Bible studies. Maybe it's time to go out to the world. And so this person said, let's get involved in the secular world. Well, how do we do that? Um, Gwen came up to me. She's only 17, but she came up to me last week. She said, Pastor, I think we can... Reimagine church, she said, one of the things we can do is we can get involved in <clears throat> um, community ed classes, things that, and they, how many get the flyer? Community ed classes, right? They've got it. If you don't get it, look it up online. Uh, she said, there's community ed classes. There's art classes. Uh, there's dance classes. Uh, hi, Dave. Who is this young lady? She's a dancer. <laughs> Diane Alanis. All right. She's a dancer. All right. And Diana had a great idea. And it'll cause problems in the church. Uh, all these ideas, believe me, they cause problems. But anyway, she said, let's have swing dance some night in the gym. 
โอ้ก็ไดเดียวิลจัสฮาวสวิงดานซ์แอนด์บัลลีฟมีอลเนเวอร์ฟอร์เกตเดอะเฟิร์สไทม์ไอเดนซ์วิธเคร์นไอเวอร์เซตเดอะพรอมแอนด์ไอสเตปอัลโอเวอร์เฮอร์โตส์บัตบัตยูโนว์ว Let's do what we can to reach the lost. And what are you doing? Who do you know, and who are you praying for that doesn't know Jesus? That's the key. What can we do? Instead of saying, "That's not for the church." Friends, Jesus hung out with sinners because he loved people. We need to befriend people that need to hear. The good news, and so there's so many, so many good opportunities. We can't touch everyone, <clears throat> but we can touch one. We can't do it all, uh, but we can do something. And I, I, I look at uh, Target spending seven billion. What are you willing to spend to get somebody into heaven? What are you willing to do? How hard are you willing to work and serve in the church? To see a little boy or little girl give their heart to Jesus, what are you going to do? What are we going to do to reimagine church, to reimagine outreach to a lost and dying society? And so here, <clears throat> um, instead of saying, "What will the church do?" Remember, you're the church, and ask yourself this morning, "What will I do? What will I do?" With these words, in order to have compassion, I believe we need to pray, and we need to be observant, and then we'll start caring for others. I'd like you to bow your heads in prayer.